Nothing could exceed the respect with which he greeted her as she entered his office the next day. He even affected not to notice that she had put on her best clothes, and he made no doubt appeared as when she had first attracted the mature yet faithless attentions of Deacon Hotchkiss at church. A white virginal muslin was belted around her slim figure by a blue ribbon, and her leghorn hat was drawn around her oval cheek by a bow of the same color. She had a southern girl's narrow feet, encased in white stockings and kid slippers, which were crossed primly before her as she sat in a chair, supporting her arm by her faithful parasol planted firmly on the floor. A faint odor of southern wood exhaled from her, and, oddly enough, stirred the colonel with a far-off recollection of pine-shaded Sunday school on a Georgia hillside and of his first love, age ten, in a short, starched frock. Possibly it was the same recollection that revived something of the awkwardness he had felt then. He, however, smiled vaguely and, sitting down, coughed slightly and placed his fingertips together. I have had an, uh, interview with Mr. Hotchkiss, but I regret to say there seems to be no prospect of uh, compromise. He paused, and to his surprise, her listless company face lit up with an adorable smile. Of course. Catch him, she said. Was he mad when you told him? She put her knees comfortably together and leaned forward for a reply. For all that, wild horses could not have torn from the colonel a word about Hotchkiss's anger. He expressed his intention of employing counsel and defending a suit, returned the colonel, affably basking in her smile. She dragged her chair nearer his desk. Then you'll fight him tooth and nail, she said eagerly. You'll show him up. You'll tell the whole story your own way. You'll give him fits and you'll make him pay. Sure, she went on breathlessly. I er, will, said the colonel, almost as breathlessly. She caught his fat white hand, which was lying on the table, between her own, and lifted it to her lips. He felt her soft young fingers even through the lyle thread gloves that encased them and the warm moisture of her lips upon his skin. He felt himself flushing, but was unable to break the silence or change his position. The next moment she had scuttled back with her chair to her old position. Uh, I uh, certainly shall do my best, stammered the colonel in an attempt to recover his dignity and composure. That's enough. You'll do it, said the girl enthusiastically. Lordy, just you talk for me as ye did for his old ditch company, you'll fetch it. Airtime. Why, when you made that jury sit up the other day, when you got that off about the American flag waving equally over the rights of honest citizens banded together in peaceful commercial pursuits, as well as over the fortress of official profli- uh, uh, Oligarchy, murmured the colonel courteously. Oligarchy? repeated the girl quickly. My breath was just took away. I said to Ma, ain't he too sweet for anything? I did, honest injun. And when you rolled it all off at the end, never missing a word, you didn't need to mark him in a lesson book but had him already on your tongue, and walked out? Well, I didn't know you nor the ditch company from Adam, but I could have just run over and kissed you there before the whole court. She laughed, with her face glowing, although her strange eyes were cast down. Alack, the colonel's face was equally flushed, and his own beady eyes were on his desk. To any other woman, he would have voiced the banal gallantry that he should now, himself, look forward to that reward, but the words never reached his lips. He laughed, coughed slightly, and when he looked up again, she had fallen into the same attitude as on her first visit, with her parasol point on the floor. I, I must ask you to uh, direct your memory to uh, another point. The breaking off of the, uh, uh, engagement? Did he give any uh, reason for it or show any cause? No. He never said anything, returned the girl. Not in his usual way? Uh, no reproaches out of the hymn book or the sacred writings? No. He just quit. Uh, seized his attentions, said the colonel gravely. And naturally you uh, were not conscious of any case for his doing so. The girl raised her wonderful eyes so suddenly and so penetratingly without reply in any other way that the colonel could only hurriedly say, I, I see, none, none, of course. At which she rose, the colonel rising also. We shall begin proceedings at once. I must, however, 
caution you to answer no questions nor say anything about this case to anyone until you are in court. She answered his request with another intelligent look and a nod. He accompanied her to the door. As he took her proffered hand, he raised the lyle thread fingers to his lips with old-fashioned gallantry. As if that act had condoned for his first emissions in awkwardness, he became his old-fashioned self again, buttoned his coat, pulled out his shirt frill, and strutted back to his desk. A day or two later, it was known throughout the town that Zaidi Hooker had sued Adoniram Hotchkiss for breach of promise, and that the damages were laid at $5,000. As in those bucolic days, the Western press was under the secure censorship of a revolver. A cautious tone of criticism prevailed, and any gossip was confined to personal expression, and even then at the risk of the gossiper. Nevertheless, the situation provoked the intensest curiosity. The colonel was approached, until his statement that he should consider any attempt to overcome his professional secrecy a personal reflection withheld further advances. The community were left to the more ostentatious information of the defendant's counsel, Messrs. Kitchum and Belser, that the case was ridiculous and rotten, the plaintiff would be non-suited, and the fire-eating star bottle would be taught a lesson that he could not bully the law, and there were some dark hints of a conspiracy. It was even hinted that the case was the reverse outcome of the refusal of Hotchkiss to pay Starbottle an extravagant fee for his late services to the ditch company. It is unnecessary to say these words were not reported to the colonel. It was, however, an unfortunate circumstance for the calmer, ethical consideration of the subject that the church cited with Hotchkiss, as this provoked an equal adherence to the plaintiff and Starbottle on the part of the larger body of non-churchgoers who were delighted at a possible exposure of the weakness of religious rectitude. I've always had my suspicions of them early like candle meetings down at that gospel shop, said one critic, and I reckon Deacon Hotchkiss didn't rope in the gals to attend just for psalm singing. Then for him to get up and leave the board before the game's finished and try to sneak out of it, said another. I suppose that's what they call religious. It was therefore not remarkable that the courthouse three weeks later was crowded with an excited multitude of the curious and sympathizing. The fair plaintiff, with her mother, was early in attendance and, under the colonel's advice, appeared in the same modest garb in which she had first visited his office. This and her downcast, modest demeanor were perhaps at first disappointing to the crowd, who had evidently expected a paragon of loveliness, as the source of the grim aesthetic defendant who sat beside his counsel. But presently all eyes were fixed on the colonel, who certainly made up in his appearance of any deficiency of his fair client. His portly figure was clothed in a blue dress coat with brass buttons, a buff waistcoat which permitted his frilled shirt to become erectile above it, a black satin stock which confined a boyish turned-down collar around his full neck, and immaculate drill trousers strapped over varnished boots. A murmur ran around the court. Old personally responsible has got his war paint on. The old war horse is smelling powder, were whispered comments. Yet for all that the most irreverent among them recognized vaguely, in this bizarre fashion, something of an honored past in their country's history, and possibly felt the spell of old deeds and old names that had once thrilled their boyish pulses. The new district judge returned Colonel Starbottle's profoundly and punctilious bow. The colonel was followed by his negro servant, carrying a parcel of hymn books and Bibles, who, with a courtesy evidently imitated from his master, placed one before the opposite counsel. This, after a first curious glance, the lawyer somewhat superciliously tossed aside. But when Jim, proceeding to the jury box, placed with equal politeness the remaining copies before the jury, the opposite counsel sprang to his feet. I want to direct the attention of the court to this unprecedented tampering with the jury by this gratuitous exhibition of matter impertinent and irrelevant to the issue. The judge cast an inquiring look at Colonel Starbottle. M may it please the court, returned Colonel Starbottle with dignity, ignoring the counsel. The defendant's counsel will observe that he is already furnished with the matter, which I regret to say he has treated, in the presence of the court, and of his client, a deacon of the church, with great superciliousness. When I state to your honor that the books in question are hymn books and copies of the Holy Scriptures, and that they are for the instruction of the jury, to whom I shall have to refer them in the course of my opening, I believe I am within my rights. The act is certainly unprecedented, 
said the judge dryly. But, unless the counsel for the plaintiff expects the jury to sing from these hymn books, their introduction is not improper, and I cannot admit the objection. As defendants' counsel are furnished with copies also, they cannot plead surprise. As in the introduction of new matter, and as plaintiff's counsel relies evidently upon the jury's attention to his opening, he would not be the first person to distract it. After a pause, he added, addressing the colonel who remained standing, The court is with you, sir. Proceed. But the colonel remained motionless and statuesque, with folded arms. I have overruled the objection, repeated the judge. You may go on. I am waiting, Your Honor, for the uh, withdrawal by the defendant's counsel of the word tampering, as refers to myself, and of impertinent, as refers to the sacred volumes. The request is a proper one, and I have no doubt will be acceded to, returned the judge quietly. The defendant's counsel rose and mumbled a few words of apology, and the incident was closed. There was, however, a general feeling that the colonel had in some way scored, and if his object had been to excite the greatest curiosity about the books, he had made his point. But impassive of his victory, he inflated his chest, with his right hand in the breast of his buttoned coat, and began. His usual high color had paled slightly, but the small pupils of his prominent eyes glittered like steel. The young girl leaned forward in her chair with an attention so breathless, a sympathy so quick, and an admiration so artless and unconscious that in an instant she divided with the speaker the attention of the whole assemblage. It was very hot. The court was crowded to suffocation. Even the open windows revealed a crowd of faces outside the building, eagerly following the colonel's words. He would remind the jury that only a few weeks ago he stood there as the advocate of a powerful company, then represented by the present defendant. He spoke then as a champion of strict justice against legal oppression. No less should he today champion the cause of the unprotected and the comparatively defenseless, save for that paramount power which surrounds beauty and innocence, even though the plaintiff of yesterday was the defendant of today. As he approached the court a moment ago, he had raised his eyes and beheld the starry flag flying from its dome, and he knew that glorious banner was a symbol of the perfect equality under the Constitution of the rich and the poor, the strong and the weak, an equality which made the simple citizen taken from the plow in the veld, the pick in the gulch, or from behind the counter in the mining town who served on that jury, the equal arbiters of justice with that highest legal luminary with whom they were proud to welcome on the bench today. The colonel paused with a stately bow to the impassive judge. It was this, he continued, which lifted his heart as he approached the building. And yet, he had entered it with an uncertain, he might almost say a timid step. And why? He knew, gentlemen, he was about to confront a profound, aye, a sacred responsibility. Those hymn books and holy writings handed to the jury were not, as his honor surmised, for the purpose of enabling the jury to indulge in uh, preliminary choral exercise. He might indeed say, alas not. They were the damning, incontrovertible proofs of the perfidy of the defendant, and they would prove as terrible a warning to him as the fatal characters upon Belshazzar's wall. There was a strong sensation. Hotchkiss turned to Sallow Green. His lawyers assumed a careless smile. It was his duty to tell them that this was not one of those ordinary breach of promise cases which were too often the occasion of ruthless mercy and indecent levity in the courtroom. The jury would find nothing of that here. There were no love letters with the epithets of endearment, nor those mystic crosses and ciphers which, he had been credibly informed, chastely hid the exchange of those mutual caresses known as kisses. There was no cruel tearing of the veil from those sacred privacies of the human affection. There was no forensic shouting out of those fond confidences meant only for one. But there was, he was shocked to say, a new sacrilegious intrusion. The weak pipings of Cupid were mingled with the chorus of the saints. The sanctity of the temple known as the Meeting House was desecrated by proceedings more in keeping with the Shrine of Venus, and the inspired writing themselves were used as a medium of amatory and wanton flirtation by the defendant in his sacred capacity as deacon.